So it's cytoplast, PTFE. Uh, we never call it polytetrafluorethylene. We call it PTFE because it's too hard to say. But it's a membrane. Again, this is showing the textured type. If you do it, um, it's non-resorbable. Non-resorbable meaning resorbable. Non-resorbable, meaning that it's uh, not for primary closure. You don't want to have primary closure and have a non-resorbable membrane underneath there. If you go that direction, you want a collagen membrane or something else underneath there. Again, smooth side down because you want the, the tissue to grow on top of the textured part. But if you're like me, I don't use the textured. It doesn't really matter oftentimes but, uh, which side you put the dimple, dimples on, but it's, there it is for you. Uh, trim it to one millimeter of each, from teeth each side. So you didn't see me have to go in there and, and trim it, but you trim on both sides to make sure it's one millimeter from each adjacent tooth. That allows the tissue to be healthy in that area. And then three millimeters, at least on the buccal and on the lingual. Membrane, again, membranes hold the, the, uh, the bone in place and keep the tissue from growing in there too fast. That allows the bone to have a head start. But when you remove this, um, what you'll find is that there's tissue grown completely over your bone once you at four weeks once you remove it what's happened is it's grown underneath there but slower it didn't just get to grow it in there fast uh, by not having the membrane there it grew from the sides slowly but that allowed the Im immature tissue you'll see it's immature tissue it doesn't look very good it bleeds easy um, but while a soft tissue um, regenerates somewhat over over the membrane uh, it will not generally grow, grow entirely over the membrane. So the outside, even though it grows underneath, the outside won't grow over. You'll have this kind of space in there that you can actually go and, and tease it out at about four, four weeks. Again, it's non-surgical removal. You don't need to get them numb typically. You can just remove the sutures. Just, of course, be gentle. But remove the sutures. I like the, the PTFE sutures as well. Uh, if you notice when I did the, the suturing, I do a one throw followed by a one throw, and that allows me to pull that down and it lets the, the, the knot actually tie down and, and suture in place and uh, snug up in place versus doing a double throw off the bat and then doing a throw. Oftentimes that won't, double throw at the beginning won't allow you to, to uh, sneak that, that knot further down and tighten up that membrane, or tighten up that, that periosteum. So I do a single throw followed by a single throw, cinch it up, not too tight, but just enough to cinch everything together, and then do a double throw that locks it down in place. So you can, if you want to watch it again, you'll see how I did that. Again, here's an example of the PTFE in place. And then this is how I, this is what it looked like if you were to, to trim it um, to make sure it's, it's an hourglass shape and it goes around. That example I gave didn't have to do it because the, uh, the socket space was wide enough. And it goes in place here. And about four weeks, that's what it looks like. You, it doesn't look very pretty, but it works. All right. Bone grafting. Okay, the options you have. I'll, uh, autograft, take from the same patient. It's from them to them. A lot of guys do that, uh, don't do that anymore because it's so much easier to get an allograft. That's where it's donated tissue. And plus, it, it, you get tissue from a donor, and Implant Direct has, has uh, direct gen that you can purchase, and it's easy to, to keep on, on hand. Otherwise, you have to go, like an autograft, you have to go to another site on the patient, take that bone out, and then place it in the location. A little harder to do, more pain for the patient. Most of the time now, they don't mind having bone from a donor that's been prepared for it. So that's the allograft. There's also a xenograft, um, like a bovine, bovine bone. Um, it could be something from, from another uh, animal uh, that's been prepared for human use. And then synthetic. And typically, as you go along here, um, in these different, different areas, the time of the resorption increases. So if you have an allograft and you're using uh, cancellous bone, that's gonna resorb faster and turn over faster. So if you wanna have a, a, a situation where you want the bone to turn over quickly, you're gonna use a cancellous bone. If you're gonna want to go slower, you use a cortical bone. And a lot of the xenografts are cortical bones, so you're gonna have it stay around longer. And so you might choose somebody who's gonna be not have an implant right away, they might have an implant, so you might choose to do a xenograft or a cortical bone so that it has a delayed um, turnover. It's longer. Synthetic doesn't go away usually. Usually it doesn't go away. Some, there's some materials out there that do re, uh, dissolve over time or resorb over time, but the, many times some of the synthetics will actually stay in place forever. You'll see it in place years later. Take an x-ray, you'll see the material there. Um, I'm not a big fan of that sometimes. I wanna see it gone. <laughs> I wanna see healthy bone. 
Um, so it's your choice, but I typically go with a, a cancellous or cortical allograft for myself. This is an example right here of complications. So um, this uh, case presented to a dentist eight months after uh, the implant was in place, asking for, for the doctor to restore it. And uh, what would you do? What would you guys do? Any concerns you, you see that you might want to be concerned about? Yeah, so right, right here in the middle, you have this, this, uh, this lucency here. What do you think it is? Most likely leftover um, granulation tissue. That's exactly what it is. Leftover granulation tissue. That's been left over when they, they took out the tooth. We didn't have, uh, we knew is that this is what it looked like four years later after they come back to the page, to the doctor who restored it and uh, had this uh, draining fistula. They didn't know is this was a, a failed root canal tooth that when they took the tooth out, they hadn't got, didn't get all the granulation tissue out of there, and it just, over time, it just was a source of, uh, of infection to grow. So, what went wrong? And when did it go wrong? It actually went wrong at the time of the extraction. That's when it really went wrong. Um, again, placing the implant in this, uh, when it had that lucency there, wasn't the great, best plan either, went wrong there too. But um, the place it went wrong, it could have been fixed first, is when they took the tooth out, to get all the granulated tissue out of there. This is what it look, might look like when you have to go back later and fix it. Um, it's much easier to degranulate the time of the extraction to go in and take an implant out and degranulate at that time. So the time of the extraction, if you're doing the bone grafting, get, the, get all the infection out of there. Go to town with it. Take home message, completely de degranulate at the time of the extraction, leaving no pathology behind. That's my, my, my take home message for you for that. All right. So how do you, you've heard probably one stage versus two stage implant surgery. So one stage and two stage implant surgery, you've probably heard of that. You know, what, is it, what does it mean? You know, what's it mean one stage versus two stage? Let's talk about that real quick. Time of surgery, it's the time of surgery of the healing that's gonna be taking place. So a single stage is uh, placing the healing abutment at the time of the surgery. Um, that's typically, in my case, typically when I have the implant torque um, is b better than 40 Newton centimeters. When I have that, I've got good stability. I might choose, and I have good patient compliance, I might choose to, to put the healing abutment on at that time and suture everything around it, and, and it's already got the healing abutment. That way, in, in uh, four to, to six months, when they come back, the healing abutment's already on there. I don't need to do a second stage. So that's called a uh, one stage. If I put a cover screw on, and it's buried underneath there, and I have to go later and uncover that, that's the two-stage surgery. And I might choose that if I was concerned about the stability of that, of that implant. If I have a torque less than 40, I might choose to, to, to bury it. Um, but it requires a second stage, second stage surgery, a minor surgery to uncover it and uh, expose that, that uh, cover screw. And then, then at that time, I place the healing, healing collar or healing abutment, whichever one you call it. It's the same, by the way. Uh, again, this is how I, I always place my implants with a torque, a torque wrench. I always want to know what the torque is at the time of surgery. Implant Direct, uh, they carry one that's a uh, predetermined uh, torque wrench. So it's more of a restorative type. And that's the kind of type I use when I'm restoring an implant. I want to know, I want to set it at that, at that torque level, and I want to have it exactly at that torque. In this case, when I'm placing the implant, I want to know what the torque ends up being, not predetermining it to be 35 or 40. I want to have a torque wrench that tells me at the end what I've gotten to. So if I've got a, if it torques down, and it final, finalizes at 70, I want to know that. But it finalizes at 40, I want to know that too. So that's why I use a, a, high, a high torque torque wrench when I place my implants. Temporizing the, at, during the implant integration. So what can you do? While the, while the implant's integrating there, what can you do? The patient's got a space they want to have covered. Very often, I recommend a Essex. I do not recommend a flipper because it puts pressure on that tissue on that implant as it's healing. I'll show you pictures of that. But this is what I use. I use a Essex, but I also want to talk about, uh, it's a clear plastic retainer, um, but only as a veneer. Right here, it's showing it as a, a full uh, crown in there, but I'll show you what I, I do. It's not a full contour uh, crown. I typically, if you see it right here, you see a space right there, but you're seeing out here is that little sliver out there. Is that little sliver out there? Yeah.
gap between where the implant is and the edge of the uh, buckle bone. I'll pack that in. I also think it helps stabilize the, the, the implant as well. But right here I'm using a, uh, I used a customizable plastic abutment, put it in place, did a suck down on there, then picked the whole thing up, and I just added a composite around the, mar the margin, and this is what it looks like uh, on an x-ray. The plastic part in the, in the middle that looks like it's empty is actually the plastic abutment. It doesn't show up on the x-ray very well, but you can see the, the metal uh, housing on the inside of it. This is our implant in place. And this is her uh, one week post op. You can see the tissue looks beautiful on the area um, using the, the plastic uh, customizable abutment. She's very, she was very happy. In fact, she's so happy I haven't seen her in a year and a half. <laughs> she's, uh, she's, she's, she's been talked to many times about coming back in. She's happy. And um, this is a temporary, it's not meant to be there forever. I should do a, I should do a worse job, I think. I might do the temporaries, I guess. All right, uh, contour healers. This is an example of a contour healer. Um, you know, it, you kind of uh, arrange it in a way that it would fit most like an, an implant or a, a tooth or a crown, and uh, it gives you this uh, the con pre contoured area. So it helps uh, it helps pre shape the the tissue uh, for your final final restoration, and it looks great because once you have it. Your, your tissue is, is, is oblong like a crown is, and then when you take your final impression, you can just copy that. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it looks like. Works really well. All right, implant impressions. So when you're taking your impressions, if you haven't uh, before uh, done a, an Im implant, um, rest, restorative implant yet, there's two options you have. You have a closed tray, or you have an open tray. An open tray, that looks like is you have this, you have to cut a, a little space for your, um, your, your uh, uh, coping to stick through so that when you take your impression, you can unscrew it while it's all set up and you pull the whole thing off. That's simply what it, what it is. Otherwise, a closed tray, typically what I do if, I, if I'm doing an impression, I'll use a closed tray. Once you pull it off, you take it out and you add your uh, implant analog to the bottom of it and you stick it right back in the, uh, the impression. This is, what it, this is what it looks like. <laughs> but the idea here is, uh, is you can take an impression here, and this is their example of taking it with a, an analog type, uh, type of uh, healing your, your abutment for your impression coping. Simple uh, crown and bridge technique. Place, this is a, clo again, a closed tray over top. You wait your time. I think they're waiting four minutes for, their, for theirs material to set up. And once it's all done, remove it. It now has an impression of that coping. Remove it, attach it to your uh, implant analog, which is basically a copy of the, the, the platform of the implant. There's the analog right there. And it looks just kind of like the, it's, a, it's a lab portion of a uh, copy of your implant. And you, there you have your, uh, your impression. All right, last thing I, I do most of the time now is I do digital. Um, I'm mostly a digital kind of guy. You put on this, uh, this scan body on top of a, um, a scan post that's placed uh, on the implant and then you scan it uh, digitally. This is an example of, I think this is a CIRAC, obviously. Yeah, won't go quieter. <laughs> This is an example of it. You can see that. It's 
simple, easy. Now we have that, you can create your crown on top of that. Um, implant abutment options. So now that you have your, your implant even uh, impression done, the options you have, you can do a, a prefab or you can do other things. So here's your options you have. Uh, prepared little uh, zirconium abutment. This is kind of like a, um, a UCLA abutment. And you can purchase those again. Those are all from Implant Direct. You can do an all uh, titanium. And uh, the problem with these guys is these, these are cementable. You have to cement on top of these guys your, your crown. And the biggest concern I have um, around uh, these cementable um, non-custom abutments is that it, it oftentimes will place the margin of the uh, abutment subgingival. So now you're, you're putting cement and cramming it kind of down in this subgingival sub area, and oftentimes the, the cement can get down below the top of it. And one of the problems we have is uh, cement sepsis that causes failures of the implants, and it's a, it's a bad thing. And we, don't, we, we want to discourage um, cement sepsis, and it's hard to, uh, to know it's even there, even on the x-ray sometimes, if you're using a cement that isn't uh, radio-opaque. You know, you can't see it down there, and it looks fine, but over time, you, you see these hap happen, and when you remove the implant, you've got all this, this cement stuck down underneath it. So, you want to be careful of that. I'm a big fan of custom abutments because of that. Um, you can raise the margin of the, uh, the abutment to the tissue. It's harder to do with, uh, when it's all uh, titanium because you don't want to see the gray of the titanium. But I oftentimes, my favorite thing is to do a custom abutment with a tie base. So the bottom part of it is a titanium, but the, the customizable portion of it, the top part, is either zirconium or it's a dilithium disilicate. So uh, you make it and it, it bonds to your tie base, and that's what you use. Um, again, I'm a big fan also of screw retained. And I'll talk a little bit about that, about screw retained versus cement retained. When would you do what and why would you do it? And I'll give you a little, little idea of why you do one or the other, or when, when, you, when you would do it. I prefer a screw retained because here you don't have to have any cement. You have one, uh, one piece, the, the crown goes on, and then you cover up the top with a, a composite, and you're in, you're in good shape. I'll give you an example right here of, of, uh, of doing that. So I remove my uh, healing abutment, and I'm placing my uh, screw retained crown. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a CIRAC mentor, so this is a CIRAC <laughs> crown. Uh, it has a tie base in there. Uh, I'm a fan of it because I get to have full control of everything here. I can choose how much pressure it's going to have on the tissue. Um, I can choose, again, uh, it's uh, ideal when you have the implant um, positioned in a way that the screw comes right out the middle of the, uh, the crown and the implant itself is angled parallel with the adjacent, adjacent teeth. And I'll show you more about that. Okay, this is using the, the implant direct, um, so loud, sorry. The implant direct uh, pre-determined. So you can basically determine what, what torque you want. Again, 30 is what I'm using here for the implant direct and torque it down to 30. I pre-choose it, it clicks when you're, when you're at that level. Again, checking the bite. I have my composite and we're done there. Uh, one thing I use, I, I like using a, a PTFE also. Uh, it's basically plumber's tape to fill in that little space. It, it creates a nice seal, but it's also so easy to work with. If you ever have to go back in there and take it out, you just pick, on, pick up on it and the whole thing kind of peels out of there. So I'm a big fan of that as well. Um, again, I'm bonding my composite into the uh, surface of it, into the access hole. That's my uh, custom abutment with tie base. So the option I have is to turn that into a custom abutment. Um, so I, I'm a big fan of CIRAC because at the middle of this, if I'm planning the, the implant and I decide, you know what, I can't do it screw retained because I'll show you again in a second what that looks like, why I might choose something else. I can then flip it and tell, okay, split it into two. Split it into, a, into an abutment part and split it into a crown part. And suddenly it makes two pieces right out of my what was going to be uh, screw retained. So, I can make that, that call as I'm uh, planning the restorative portion. So, so when does screw retain and when does cement? Here's my, <laughs> um, <laughs> this, 
this is a good case that came to me in 2000. Um, uh, here's the screw retained. Um, it came in. One of the concerns we had is, uh, wow, what do we do? Rather than have this off-angled cantilever type of, of, can we do a single implant right here? Um, What's it going to look like? Well, here we're going to look like a, marsh, a, a, a gigantic uh, mushroom in the middle of this, uh, this space that he has there. It's so big. Or we chose um, instead to do two implants, two smaller implants. And in doing so, we found something along with the, the bone. If we angled it slightly, we could probably do one of them. We could do cement retained. And one of them we were able to do screw retained. And what was the difference? And you can tell it's screw retained because one has the, the filling at the very top and one has the filling in the middle of the, of the abutment down partway through. So um, what you're dealing with is the line of draw um, for the platform. If it's not in parallel, the line of draw between the teeth, if it's off angled like that, that's when you know you need to cement. If you're going to be choosing to, if you can get it the other way around, where you have par it's parallel, the line of draw is parallel to the, um, the adjacent teeth, then you can screw retain. And that's really the, the, the gist of, of when to screw retain and when you need to cement retain. So if you follow that, that in, in you're making your decisions restoratively, you'll know when it's best to screw retain and when it's best to, when, when you can, screw retain. So cement retain oftentimes in the anteriors, I'll cement retain because I'm, I oftentimes will have, I would otherwise have the uh, access hole coming through the center of the, uh, the inside of the ledge, not a good plan, or at least closed enough to it to be a concern or thinning that, that porcelain out. So anteriors oftentimes I will cement retain, posteriors I follow this rule of the line of draw with the axis of the, of the implant. Hope that makes sense. Yeah. Here's an example of uh, immediate extraction. I'll kind of give you what, one of the things we planned here. This is a fractured root. Um, and so uh, a 13 millimeter implant was planned, um, slightly angulated, and I'll show you why. We wanted to avoid having to deal with the, with the sinuses at all, so we knew we could slightly angle the implant, but still get an ex excellent result with it. So we did that slightly to the mesial. Um, we decided if all we had to do was follow the palatal root and plan how we're, gonna, how we're gonna off angle it to avoid the uh, sinus, and this is how, what we ended up with. Uh, it was positioned yeah, perfectly where we, where we wanted it, but what it left us restoratively was slightly off-angled. So obviously, this left me with a cement retained. But if you notice in the cement retained here, how high I was able to put the margin of the, of the abutment was really high there, because I didn't have to, I can do wherever the contour of the, of the tissue was. So, which we did we use? Again, we use cement retained in this case. All right, there's our, again, we were able to place it immediately because again, we used, um, we used 60, 65 Newton centimeters of torque at the time of the placement. Um, but what allowed us to do, um, let me notice right here, is that it looks like this void right there, but that plastic abutment actually doesn't show up very well on x-rays. And so what you do, what you are able to see is the, metal housing in the inside of the, uh, of the abutment. So um, very, those are great um, restorative uh, options there using that uh, the custom, the customizable uh, plastic abutment. Right, we, we, we have that quite a bit here at our office. Um, again, both they allowed a great soft tissue response. So this is what she looked like uh, day, of, uh, day of restoring. It looks beautiful in pink. One thing I want to make sure you do is plan the restorative process, prosthesis before planning the implant. So planning, beginning with the end in mind, again, this is uh, Stephen Covey's, implant dentistry is a restorative driven discipline with a large surgical component, but we want to begin with the end in mind. So it's, we have to be driven by the restorative portion of it. Um, again, start planning with the prosthesis. If you're planning an implant that won't let you place a, uh, a restorative portion at the end, then there's no really good reason for that implant to be there in the first place. We've seen cases where the implant was sticking out um, halfway through the, the buckle root of a tooth and, or where it should be coming out the incisal area. It was coming out the buckle and it, there was just no way of restoring that thing without being just hideous. So that case we had to remove the implant and, and graft it all then, re, then place it again later. 
So planning your prosthesis only makes a, a difference when you provide your surgeon with a well-planned surgical guide. So if you're going to have plan it, if the, if the surgeon doesn't follow your plan, then it's not really helpful <laughs> that your surgeon is doing that. So you want to plan it well. This is what we do. Um, again, I do it digitally. So I get to plan my implant ahead of time. I plan the prosthesis, how it's going to look, and then I actually go in and take that that guy, that um, the scan of the 3D scan or uh, of the mouth uh, digitally, the CBCT, and take the um, the digital uh, impression, and I'm able, to I'm able to correlate those together. So we get this uh, this overlapping of the CBCT and the uh, digital scan, and you get ability to place the implant exactly where you want it to come out of the center of the of the crown. And you can put it parallel to adjacent teeth and screw retain it. So what that allows us to do then is to create our own guide. We do a lot of, uh, of uh, guided implant surgeries here, and this is what it looks like for us. So if your surgeon is uh, not going to follow your prosthetic plan, um, it's kind of hard to, to convince you to do it because they'll, if they don't follow your plan, you would otherwise have to provide them a guide to tell them this is where I want it, place it right here. So for me, it's, it's better to place my own because I could have full control of the whole thing. I'd be able, I like to have the control of where that implant goes so that when I restore it, I know it's going to be stored the way I want it to be uh, placed. So, so how to avoid uh, common implant complications. Um, one of the things you got to re remember is that during the implant um, healing process, there's a time where osteoclasts begin to break down the bone. And that time uh, has a dip in the stability of the implant. You have initial stability when you place the implant. Um, you might have 60 newtons of you know, solid uh, stability, but then as the body begins to heal, it breaks down the bone with osteoclasts before it builds it back up. And that dip happens about four weeks, three to four weeks, maybe six weeks in there. You have the implants, it's more at jeopardy at that time. So you gotta be careful when you're, when you're uh, play, having the implant to make sure it's out of occlusion. So if you're gonna do an immediate and have it, um, have it temporary, that's uh, available for, the, for the, someone to chew on, they've got to be compliant and you've got to have out of occlusion, um, far out of occlusion, because what happens is um, the adjacent teeth have periodontal ligaments. They can actually absorb some of the forces. When they absorb those forces and your implant can't do that, your implants, again, in bone, as, your, as the cushioning happens of your periodontal ligaments of the adjacent teeth, it allows that tooth to get in contact that wouldn't otherwise be in contact, especially if they're, if they're bruxers at nighttime clenching their teeth. They're able to now contact that implant that you thought was out of occlusion because you didn't have them pressing underneath high, high stress or high tension. And so that tooth actually is, is actually coming in contact. So be sure that you have them, uh, you test them under high compression butting down f firmly to make sure that implant isn't being touched while it's in the healing process. And even when you finally have a final restoration there, you don't want that tooth to be under compression and hitting hard when they're biting down firmly and the adjacent teeth are able to hit um, uh, and load uh, the ligaments. So again, when you're, when you're doing your final restoration, don't treat the implant as a normal tooth. You gotta remember that's an implant tooth. It's, it's connected to the bone, not to, not to ligaments. So it'll act differently. So make sure you have uh, plenty of space. Check the implant restorations under compression and heavy extrusive loads, keeping contacts on the implant sort of lighter than adjacent teeth. And occlusal guards may prevent, um, may also add protection as well. So keep that in mind if you're, if you're, when you're restoring the implants. All right, one thing I wanna make sure you also don't do is use an all zirconium custom abutment. So for a while there, you know, we were, a lot of us were doing that using these custom abutments that were all zirconium, head to toe, uh, you know, no, no titanium uh, insert at all. And so the problem they had is that the internal surfaces, the zirconium is, is abrasive. And so you now have that, that abrasive zirconium inside the titanium. And there's these micro movements that still occur. Um, you, know, you, you think it's, it's not gonna move at all, but it does. It has a little movement in there. Over time, that little movement in there will abrade the inside of the titanium, and that's, that you can't undo that once that, begins to, that process begins to happen. And that begins to allow the little shifting to occur, and then it gets off angle, and it can actually, you actually end up having a breakage, oftentimes, with the, the zirconium. Um, and then, well, unfortunately, 
thinking we'll be able, okay, now I can go back and put a titanium in place. The titanium won't fit precisely either because the damage from the zirconium has already been done on the internal surface of that titanium. So don't use a zirconium, all zirconium abutment. If you're gonna use a uh, custom abutment that's tooth colored like that, have it with a, a tie base, something, some kind of, of insert that's titanium. You want titanium to contact titanium. So again, adjacent, um, adjacent teeth, but also one of the problems we have is, is not placing your implant deep enough. And this is showing a case where, where the implants were placed at the height of the adjacent um, uh, contour, had a contour of the, of the teeth, the zenith of, of the teeth. Well, that didn't make any room for uh, run room, running room or, or um, for the abutment to be placed. So it put it right at the same height. And I'll show you an example of this. What it should have been is placed a little bit deeper. And this is an example of it. This looks fine right here, looking at the, the um, prosthetic on, on the model, but once you look at it close, closer at it, they, they got the zenith right there, but what was really happening is that it actually looked like this. The problem we're having in this case was the implant wasn't placed deep enough and was so high that they had to then jump over the tissue and make it look like it was actually coming out of the tissue, out of the tissue a different area now. And now this tissue is constantly uh, has an issue of uh, underneath there where you can't get in there and clean very easily and that becomes a problem. What it should have been looked like is, is this. They should have extended it a little further down then they could have had a, a contoured implant abutment or crown that came out of the tissue in a much better, much better uh, position. Again, just being aware that oftentimes the position needs to be a little deeper than you expect sometimes. This is another good example. This example was uh, brought to us at the, I'm also part of the DDS mentoring of Gary O'Brien. This is a case that was brought um, to, to us showing this discoloration that was there. And they gave us an x-ray of what it looked like. And we, we noticed, hey, this probably should have been dropped down a little further than where it was at. I'll show you the x-ray right here. You can see the x-ray shows they placed the implant so high at the height of the contour of the adjacent teeth. You want to drop it down about three millimeters below the, um, the zenith of adjacent teeth in order to get this running room for the abutment. So this is what the adjacent teeth, where it should have been, right about there. That would give them a nice running room for a good, a good crown on top of that. So rather than here, that down there. So we made it look a lot better. In this case, you probably still have some dehiscence. You have that, that, that graying there. Probably have some dehiscence of, on that implant, but it would have been in a better location to begin with. All right, implant maintenance is the last part we're gonna talk about. Um, so since teeth shift, um, once a year during regular checkups, examine the implant restoration uh, under compressive and heavy discursive loads. Make sure the contacts are still light. The opposing tooth may drop down a little bit and begin contacting harder than it had before. And so just check those bites every once in a while. Make sure that you're checking the occlusion. To make sure it's not changing and hitting in different ways than it did before. So again, things shift over time. You wanna check those occlusions. Of your, of your implants to make sure it's light and still functioning uh, without heavy forces on them. Other things you might look at is, is the hygiene. Um, using, selecting instruments that are, um, aren't um, metal, because metal on metal, it's gonna scrape that, Im that implant material and cause problems over time. And so you wanna keep it with softer materials where a tooth would respond well to metal scrape, metal scrape it heals well, it, uh, it, it all changes the surface. When you do it with metal, it becomes an opportunity for bacteria to congregate. So using um, uh, this material that's uh, synthetic uh, rather than metal. Uh, even ultrasonics have, um, have nylon or plastic sheaths that can go on top of the, the um, ultrasonics to keep them from scratching the, abut the uh, abutments or the implants. So make sure you keep, uh, keep that in mind when, when you're having your, your hygienist uh, maintaining the, the health of the, of the tissue around the implants. All right. And that's it for us. Um, last thing, I, again, I, we teach an implant course uh, at our office, hands-on course, dental implant camp. Uh, we also uh, provide um, guides for, uh, for CERIC Guide 2, um, for Implant Direct um, and, and Zimmer. Um, so if you're interested in having uh, guides for your implant, your CERIC Guide 2, we have those for you there. Again, it's dental implant camp and uh, 
and we do another course uh, actually placing implants on patients as well. You can find it, for, find it on uh, Dental Implant Camp if you're interested. Uh, if you want to go on beyond that um, in placing a single implant, uh, we love the uh, maxi course. The AAID puts on a great maxi course. I love organs. We do a lot of surgeries. Um, but I uh, appreciate you guys listening and being here with me today.